coffee table. There's a stuffed cat. There's a vase of flowers. And now they have a sofa. They call the idea sofa. So they take it to the front of the church on a Sunday morning. They take it to the mall on a Saturday night. They take it to the sports field on Friday night. And they set it up. And people are attracted to it because it looks so strange. And then they invite people to sit down and share their idea for what would make for a better Darwin. People sit down, they share their idea, and then everybody who has an idea is invited to come to the school on a Saturday afternoon for a workshop. And at the workshop, they develop their idea into a proposal. And at the end of the workshop, they pitch their proposal to everybody else in the room. And everybody's entitled to vote which projects they're going to support with their time and up to a thousand pounds. No application form, no contract, just really simple. In the first six months, 37 projects resulted from this process, all involving people who had never been involved in the community before. So these women came together and formed soldier support groups, cleaning up the local cemetery. The young people formed a conservation association, a green cycle program. They worked to clean up the local estate and plant daffodils everywhere. They worked with the kids to build a skate park. They organized a scarecrow festival. 37 projects in six months because they went where the people were. Too often times we're always trying to get people to come to us. We need to go where the people are. Third lesson I learned is what's important to start where people are, don't leave them there. People need to see results. People are feeling so powerless these days. When I was organizing, I was trying to organize people around issues, so I knocked on the door and said, are there any problems in the neighborhood? They'd say, you can't fight City Hall. <laughs> Or I'd knock on the door and say, there are problems in the neighborhood. They'd say, why, are you a lawyer? <laughs> and the implication was that only lawyers and politicians have any power in our society, which is a pretty sad indictment of a democracy. So we tried to give people a sense that by banding together, they could make change. So we did start with rural peace, because it's kind of hard to see results. We did start with climate change, because it's kind of hard to see results. Doesn't mean we shouldn't work on those big issues. But people are never going to work on the big stuff if they don't think they even have power to make change on their own street. So you start with small, winnable issues, small projects. Give people a sense of the value of collective action. And once people start to see the power of people, they're much more likely to start working on the bigger stuff. And then the fourth lesson, don't sit on your assets. <laughs> and the point here is that absolutely everybody in our community, absolutely everybody, without exception, everybody has gifts to give to our community. I like to think of them as three kinds of gifts. Gifts of the head, that person's knowledge. Gifts of the heart, that person's passions. Gifts of the hands, that person's skills. Absolutely everybody's got them. But increasingly, we're putting labels on huge sections of our community that label them not by their gifts, but by what they're missing. We label people by their deficiencies. We use terms like homeless. I got a friend who's a minister at a church in Cincinnati, Ohio. The members of his church have a soup kitchen they operate for homeless men in the basement. They finally got the idea and says, why don't we interview these men and find out what their gifts are? Turns out, a bunch of these men like to cook. So they asked him, would you like to help cook the meals? They were overjoyed. Nobody ever thought to ask them that before. And after a